Good morning, everybody. I'm going to be fairly fast with this talk. I'm afraid Devon hasn't really had a golden age. It's still to come, I hope. Uh, this picture that you're about to see shows um, a lime kiln. And in Devon, if you can see a lime kiln, probably within a few miles there'll be a quarry, and if you're really lucky, there'll be a cave in it. Uh, lime kilns are a very good indicator of where the limestone is in Devon. It's different. There are multiple small limestone outcrops. Devonian limestone is some of the older limestone we've got in the UK. Uh, there are few large cave systems that have been found. The surface features in Devon have been very heavily modified, and the caves are usually found in quarries. There are few caves, if any, on common land, which obviously provides access issues, and they are old by UK standards. So what effect has this had on caving activity? Well, they're because they're widely distributed, there are a few focal points for cavers to meet. There are problems with access to caves. The pressure on the caves that are there from outdoor activity groups has been very heavy in the past, and there are relatively few opportunities for original exploration. There are also few major caving organizations. However, Devon has been the home of a considerable amount of cave research. We have uh, archaeology, William Pengelly springs to mind, natural history, John Hooper and Aubrey Glenny are both names that feature prominently. And then in exploration, we have names like Edgar Reed, John Hooper, Wilfred Joint, and Mike Bond. Archaeology, this gentleman, William Pengelly, who was an FRGS member, uh, was responsible for systematically excavating a site and recording it accurately. He helped to demolish the view that the earth was only a few thousand years old when he excavated a newly discovered cave in Brixham and, and under a stalagmite layer he found, layers of cave uh, found bones of cave lion and woolly rhino. Um, he later also conducted excavations at Kent's cavern and along with the woolly, woolly rhino he found uh, some man-made flints. Sadly, our heritage is uh, not exactly... Um, well, I don't think it's that well respected, really. That house is there, there you can see, is a terrace of houses, and currently, as far as I can see, is a holiday let. Underneath it is this famous cave where Pengeli excavated to an extremely high level of accuracy. The only photograph I could obtain, because I couldn't get permission from anybody to get into the cave, was one taken by uh, Don McFarlane, who was visiting from the U US a few years ago to do, still do research in the same cave. Well, I think it's a bit sad, really, isn't it? There's not even a plaque outside. Another cave that is probably known to most of you is Kent's Cavern, because it is one of the few, if only, show caves in Devon at the present time. Very nicely decorated. It's been extensively excavated. And this uh, photograph shows uh, Chris Proctor here, whose name has cropped up uh, quite frequently earlier on in the science talks. And now you can see what he looks like. Um, a jawbone excavated here in 1927 was eventually successfully uh, dated to about 40,000 years or so. So it's the oldest modern human remain in Europe. And we're still working. They're still working in Kent's Cavern on undisturbed sediments. It certainly isn't worked out. There are other sites. Tor Bryan in Devon. Uh, you've got a, 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 a valley there with very old bisected cave systems in it. Uh, big, big cave passage, and again, it was uh, extensively excavated in the 19th century, but people have come back and worked there more recently in the last 25 years. I, I think this was a team from Oxford University um, finding Mesolithic remains. And uh, another cave next door, Tor Newton Cave. Here they are working, uh, pulling out, I think they were coprolites, hyena poo. Uh, more modern, you've got uh, the old grotto here, which actually had a medieval uh, chapel tacked onto it. But people have been working in the last 50 years. Kitley Caves at Yampton, just outside Plymouth. Uh, again, it's a place where you've got a, a quarry that has bisected a cave system. Uh, and one of the bigger caves was turned into a show cave. 
then the former editor of the Speleologist mag magazine, which some of you older cavers might remember, called John Dryden, um, set it up as a show cave again in the 1970s for a while. Um, then along came a chemistry teacher from, uh, this is uh, Kitley Caves, uh, called John Wright from Plymouth, and he started excavation. Now, he wasn't really a caver, but he was just as impressive as, as all the rest of you diggers here. Um, he set up this and started working on something called Henhole and found a large number of bones, which are currently residing in uh, Plymouth Museum. John was very shy. Uh, that was the only picture I've actually got of him. Uh, he didn't like to be photographed in case the kids at school found out about him and turned up and vandalized the place, apparently. Uh, Chris Proctor here again, looking at some of the bones that came out of the cave. A uh, lot of interest nowadays, more on small mammal bones, uh, apparently, and there were plenty of those there as well. Natural history. Well, in the 1960s and 50s, John Hooper did a lot of work there. Uh, currently, uh, freshwater biological work by Lee Knight and others. And Chris Proctor has done a lot of work on the biota in intertidal caves. Here's a photograph from the 1940s or 50s uh, when John Hooper was working on bats. He was, they were measuring them and ringing them and discovering that they flew quite large distances. And the bats you tended to get in Devon were either greater or lesser horseshoe bats. This is John Hooper. I got this from a, it was a colour supplement article about him some years ago with his ultrasonic bat detector. But he was a very talented film cameraman as well. He made a superb film, very, very funny, probably the original comic caving film. You can find it online if you look in the Mendic Cave Research Archive on YouTube. And I, well worth seeing about the Squire of Penrecker. Very funny indeed. And here he is underground, probably in a mine, uh, listening for bats again with his bat detector. Now we have some biological work. That's Lee Knight the top there, looking at traps for interstitial um, beasties, in other words, in, in the rocks in the, in the roof, and he's put a sort of net down there to catch them. Chris Proctor, again, he gets everywhere. He's looking at an intertidal cave on Berry Head at Brixham there. And uh, one of the first uh, beasties to get identified from Devon was this creature, Nephagus glenii, named after Brigadier Denny, uh, Glenny, and it was first captured in Pridhamsley Cavern by um, Mary Hazelton and Aubrey Glenny. And I discovered when I did some research on this that my old medical school, St. Bart's, was the place where they first found one of these but misidentified it, so they were first found a mile away from here at um, Smithfield. It's a funny old world. Uh, this is to orientate you in case you're not sure where parts of Devon are. And I hope you can see uh, enough there to be orientated. Uh, Paynton is fairly well known, Dawlish and Exeter. And uh, I'm going to talk about some of the major caves now. And you can see Pridhamsley Cavern there, very, very close to the A38. Very convenient, really. It's a phreatic cave, like most of the Devon caves, and was probably found by quarrying some time ago. The history seems to be shrouded in murk when you try to do any research on it. It's got an impressively big entrance area, but the actual way into the cave is slightly smaller. Here we are inside the entrance area, and then right in the center of this rock face you're looking into is a low crawl. As you can see, the cave is somewhat muddy, and you can also see that those uh, stalactite uh, formations have been damaged. Those could have been damaged many, many moons ago. There was a vogue, as people probably know, in uh, Victorian times for people, and earlier, for taking out stalactites and uh, putting them in artificial grottos. Uh, and some people made quite a bit of money out of it. However, this next photograph shows you a bit of Pridhamsley that was found about 30 years ago by digging which is pristine, and it shows what the rest of the cave probably looked like once upon a time. And in fact, if we move on, only a few feet, in fact, you can turn around and look at the point, um, somebody noticed two or three years ago that there was a little hole, and he thought, oh, I think there's something there. So he started chiseling it, 
um, and I think they resorted to slightly more powerful devices, and opened up this chamber, which they called the final curtain. And it's absolutely beautiful, absolutely smashing. Um, these photographs aren't mine. They're photographed by Rhett Harrison, one of the DSS. But again, it illustrates that if, you, you know, the, the rest of the cave must have looked like this at one time. This is Bishop's Chamber, one of the chambers of the cave. It shows the, the sort of phreatic nature of the cave there. You're looking up there into a, an upper passage called the Attics with this beautiful eroded round hole in the ceiling. And, and the next shot shows what a Swiss cheese this cave is like. There are holes everywhere. Um, and it can be very confusing when you get in there the first time. There is a, 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 a fairly good trade route through, and this takes you down eventually past something that's known as the pit, uh, down a, a rather nice place called the Grand Gallery, all getting bigger, and you end up at a lake. Now, the lake is um, surprisingly deep, and there's some interesting features to it. Since they built the uh, dual carriageway outside the cave, the water levels fluctuate much more dramatically. There is flow out of the lake in very high water conditions, as I've seen it myself. Eels have been seen in the lake. Whether they've come over land through the cave, which I find a little hard to believe, I don't know. Um, this is taken in very high water conditions a couple of years ago. This is taken uh, two or three weeks ago in average conditions. Now, if you go for a paddle there, you're going to get a big surprise, because when you get to the far end, the water is 34 meters deep. It's staggeringly deep, and it gave a shock to the original explorers um, when they lowered a string down it and measured it later. But somebody came along and decided to dive it quite some time ago. People don't realize that. One of the earliest cave dives, probably in the UK, after the work in Wookiee and up north, was one done by a couple of RN divers who turned up there in 1955 and dropped down to a depth of about 20 meters before they thought better of it and came back up again. Um, the visibility, as you can imagine, sank to naught, and I shouldn't think their lights were much cop then either. In the 1970s, uh, a group from Devon came along and decided they'd have a, a proper go at the lake with you know, modern diving gear, scuba deer. And so they, they dropped a shot line to the bottom and worked their way down the walls. And they were extremely surprised to find a large underwater arch at about 23 meters. Um, for, for those of you who have been here all weekend, this was taken relatively recently. And sadly, it's, it's one of the, probably the last diving photographs of uh, Brian Schofield Scoff, who um, some of you will remember. And he very kindly accompanied my daughter in, into the lake uh, for a dive. And this is him going back through that arch. And when you come out through that arch, you are in an enormous underwater chamber. It's probably one of the biggest in the West Country. Across the bottom, it's probably something like 40 meters in diameter. Without water in it, the roof height's probably something like 50 meters. It's, it's a stunning place. And the water, as you might imagine, being static water, is very clear indeed. But this cave, I'm sure, has got a lot more to offer, and I'm sure there's quite a bit of science that could be done on it, and I'm not aware of any that's been done on it. The walls are very interesting, the material of them. Anyway, you come up, and you're in this large chamber, and this is a bit of the iceberg effect. There's a lot more underwater. People are still examining the walls, even to this day. Um, it's very well decorated, again, illustrating how the other side of Pridham's we must have looked at one time. And you get these uh, aragonite uh, crystals here. They seem to occur mainly on the slate and limestone boundaries, and I'm going to show you some more later on. Uh, you can climb up a ladder. Somebody's rigged a ladder up there. You can climb up, and that gives you a view down into the lake, and somebody's fired a flashbulb underwater there. But it really is magnificently decorated on the walls, and uh, it, it's well worth a visit. Right, where are we going next? Baker's Pit and Reed's Cave. OK, uh, these two caves are really one longest cave in Devon. Uh, we're looking straight down on the top of uh, Buckfast Lee Hill. You can see the gutted remains of a church. 
up there. Baker's Pit Cave, you'll see in a moment, is that little hole in the middle of the field. Reed's Cave is over here in a quarry that is jointly managed by the Devon Wildlife Trust and the William Pengelly Cave Studies Trust, which is the building adjacent to it. So that's Reed's Cave. There's the William Pengelly Cave Studies Trust. This is Buckfast Lee. So uh, here we are inside Baker's Pit. It remained closed for a period of time at one stage, and uh, that, in fact, is the old entrance, which I've never seen. Uh, very old picture with me in it at the back, taken in about 1967, when we first started visiting it, and it was a quarry with a 12-foot climb down ladder. And you can drive into the quarry until the date there with the old Anglia. They then drove a horizontal tunnel across all this fill they put in, all this rubbish, and of course it collapsed. So now they drove, they drove a shaft straight down through the centre of the field, about uh, 20 metres deep, and that's where you go in now. And I think they've changed it again as a ladder there when I went in there a few weeks ago. Great big chamber at the entrance, just inside the entrance. Having been closed for a while, a lot of the floor detail has regenerated in places, and uh, it's quite pretty, you know, a lot of floor formations, cave pearls, these sort of laced work gowers, um, more pearls, and uh, formations. And quite a lot of backbones as well in certain places. Quite colourful. Uh, this is a, a place called the Devon, uh, Glorious Devon series, and this is Red Chamber, strangely enough. Um, and there's some quite large chambers in there. But you can see there is a predominantly muddy hue to everything, and uh, I won't claim that it's uh, uh, pristinely decorated, uh, except in odd locations. Again, it's been heavily used by outdoor groups and has suffered to a certain extent over the years. Now, the big golden age moment for Devon was the discovery in 1968 of the Plymouth Extension, which was over a kilometre of passage and became accessible through two routes, one of which had probably always been open but not noticed. Very well decorated in places, so complex, it was one of those, the cave you cannot survey. And the, the, 50 years later, thanks, 50 years later, we're still, um, we're still waiting for... Uh, no, we have got the survey now. Uh, Reed's Cave, again... Very uh, attractive cave, any cave you need a step ladder to get into. And uh, this was opened up using a car jack to break a stale floor. A beautiful chamber inside after some wildlife there. Cave spider, I mentioned. Science projects done there. Easter chamber, beautiful chamber there. And then an upper series through ser and series of squeezes. Again, some very nice formations. It's one of the few caves where you have to have a leader in Devon. And uh, then you move on to another part of the cave. You get to these things called the hedgehogs. And uh, there's a churchyard. And there's a tomb. And it belonged to Squire Cabell, local hellraiser. And this chap came along and thought, I can write a book about that, The Hound of the Baskervilles. But the interesting thing is, that uh, if you look, they found something interesting about where the arrow points, and just above it is the tomb. This is the little man. You can just see the little man in the distance, right under the tomb. Hmm. Right, very quickly, Brixham, more caves. These are thought to be partly formed Again, lens, lens caves, freshwater and seawater lens caves. Chris Proctor again, diving there, doing research. We certainly noticed when we started exploring these in the 1980s, yep, we're, all right, we're getting near the end now, <laughs> um, that they were natural caves, uh, and they were also not sea caves as such. They were phreatic caves that flood during the tide. You can see the style formations there. Fossil Beach there. All sorts of interesting caves to look at. 
And uh, this, is, this is tidal now, Berryhead Quarry. That's a tidal pool. You go into the caves there, tree roots, interesting root balls with different beasties, and exploration. Yep, there's digging going on. I'm going to very quickly go through it, very quickly. King's Taint and outcrop, big resurgences, collapse. Only one cave known there. There's lots more to find. The only thing we found down there was Rocky Acres Cave, and we gave up on that because we just hadn't got the personnel for it. It's directly over the resurgence. The longest bit of cave found in recent years is Skullcap Cave at Chudley, and that was done on a mission. We went out to look for a cave and dug it open, dug open 60 meters of cave. And here you can see nice decorated fossil streamway. Right, <laughs> just, we're still digging in Devon. As you can see, these are other caves that are currently on the, the schedule, and one of these days, we'll find something decent. Okay, I'll just go blast through the last few in a few seconds. Afton Rift, one of the longer ones. Um, only stream came in Devon is Clifford's Cave. Bunker's Hole, stunning aragonite crystals, protected by a tight squeeze. Plymouth, which is the last area, another big cave system. Thank you very much. I knew that was going to be a quick blast. Hey, thank you very much for that.